In this video, we will prove that the vector space r over q is of infinite dimension. And we will prove that by contradiction. Namely, we will assume that the dimension of r over q is some finite number n. Among other things, that means that the maximum number of linearly independent vectors in r over q could be n. We, however, will find n plus 1 linearly independent vectors in r over q, thus contradicting our assumption. So at this point, we need a good idea. It is not obvious how we should proceed, but we do have a number n that potentially could be very large, and n plus 1 always has to be one larger. So we might think of the idea to use something of which we know there are infinitely many of them. One idea that might come to mind would be prime numbers. And it turns out prime numbers will work just fine for our purposes. But again, that's not an obvious idea. It's a good idea that somebody had at some point. So let's let P1 all the way up to Pn plus 1 be the first n plus 1 prime numbers. We're going to use these. As you see, there are n plus 1 of these. We're going to use these to create these n plus 1 linearly independent vectors. But we're not going to use these numbers directly. We need another good idea here, and the other good idea is to take the natural logarithm of each one of these numbers. Now, it's not obvious, again, at all why one would do that at this point. But within the course of the proof, it may become obvious. So, these are all members of our set R. We're going to use those as the vectors. These are our vectors. And we want to prove that there are n plus 1 of them. And we want to prove that they are linearly independent. Now, it might seem obvious that there are n plus 1 of them. But it needn't be obvious. We could, for example, imagine that taking the natural logarithm of the first prime could maybe give us the same answer as when we take the natural logarithm of the second prime, right? That is a, an, a scenario that one could maybe imagine, but it is not the case. Because the natural log is injective we know that that cannot be the case. In other words, we know that any time that x is not equal to y, that the natural log of x is also not equal to the natural log of y. So since we know that to be the case, then we know that we indeed have n plus 1 different vectors here. Now it remains to be proved that they are linearly independent. So in order to show that, we know, need to show that a linear combination of, of this type, where we have scalars from Q, so rational scalars, being multiplied together with these vectors. And we're going to have n plus 1 of these. That if we have a linear combination like this that adds up to 0, that in order to show the linear independence of these vectors, 
we need to show that each one of these scalars has to be equal to zero. In other words, the only way that this equation here could hold is if all of the scalars are themselves equal to zero. That's what we want to show. So I have rewritten this equation here with the summation symbol just to make things a little more compact. And this will be the beginning of our proof that these vectors are indeed linearly independent. So the first thing we want to do is to use a fact that we would not be able to use if we were in R over R. Right? We are in R over Q. So this first step that we will be taking takes that into consideration. So since we know that these AIs here are all rational numbers, right? All of these scalars here are rational numbers. We know they can be written as fractions. So, for example, we could write every AI as for example some JK over uh sorry, JI over KI. The first thing we want to do is multiply through by all of these denominators. Because if we do that, we can get all of these denominators to cancel away, and then we'll end up with some huge number here up top that will, in any case, be an integer. Right? We don't know what exactly number it will be, but it doesn't matter. It will be an integer. So we're wanting to get rid of all of these AIs that were rational numbers and replace them with BIs that are integers. And that's what we've done in this step. So we've just basically transformed what we did. We just multiplied by some large number and got this equation here. And now we're just going to start forming our equation in a bit of a different way until we reach a certain point where we'll be able to prove what it is we want to prove. So the first thing we're going to do now is just use some basic laws for dealing with logarithms to move this scalar into a different position. So basically it will be an exponent now. And what we want to do now is something that might not be obvious, but that makes sense if you think that the natural logarithm has an inverse, and that inverse is the exponential function. In other words, raising e to some power. Because what we're wanting to do here is to raise e to this power and raise e to this power. Because if obviously if the sides of the equation are equal, then what we get by doing that will also be equal. In other words, we're just using this side of the equation as an argument for the exponential function and this side of the equation as an argument for the exponential function. So now we can simplify that somewhat. e to the zeroth power is of course 1. And here I've just taken the liberty of removing this summation symbol because when the sum is in this form we might recognize that the so-called functional uh, equation, functional equation of the exponential function can be used, which is that the exponential function of x plus y is equal to the exponential function of x times the exponential function of y. And we can use that here iteratively to now 
reform our equation again now in the form of a product this times this times this times this times this etc and now we can see how nice it is again that the logarithmic function the natural log and the exponential function are inverses of each other because we can now basically cancel these two functions right this here and this which means that just the prime numbers remain in other words we have this equation so all we need to know now before we're finished is what these b's are what these exponents are so there's a couple different possibilities right these exponents could be for example positive numbers but if they were positive numbers let's say this was a six and this was a seven or something like that right a prime number raised to some positive power and another prime number raised to some positive power could never yield a one right that could not work but what if they were negative well if they were negative powers for example this is negative six and negative seven let's say well that would just mean that we can just put them on the bottom of a fraction and now instead of a negative six and a negative seven we would just have a six and a seven and those are just examples of course but that would mean that we have again positive exponents with prime numbers which means we're going to have some large number here which means altogether we have something that is less than one so that can't work what if we had a mixture and this is where it gets interesting what if we had some positive numbers here and maybe somewhere in the middle we have another positive number and we had negative numbers and some negative more some negative negative exponents which would mean that we had some maybe some positive prime powers up on top divided by some other prime powers right these are going to have some power attached to them and we might imagine that these could all cancel out in some sort of way and give us a one but if we think about the fact that these are indeed prime numbers we know that that cannot happen there can be no canceling here because each one of these numbers is co-prime to every other number so no canceling can happen at all and in fact we see now that we wouldn't have even needed prime numbers right even if for example in this situation if we would have had a four on the top and a nine on the top and a maybe a, a mm, 55 on the bottom right these can also not cancel we could have just used co-prime numbers but the prime numbers uh, did the job nicely so there's no need to regret that choice prime numbers were a good choice because they got the job done even if they were a little bit more ammunition that we might have than we might have needed in any case what we've determined is that these exponents can be neither positive nor negative nor a mixture of positive and negative numbers that means they all have to be zero in other words all of these b's are equal to zero in fact every single one of them has to be equal to zero now let's ask yourself what that means so if these bi's here are all zero and the way that we got to these bi's was by multiplying ai's times some numbers and these numbers that we multiplied by right these denominators basically they couldn't have been zero because if they were zero they couldn't have been in the denominator of a fraction right so basically we were multiplying these ai's by some non-zero numbers and ending up with zeros and that can only happen 
if we started with zeros to begin with. So in other words, all of these AIs were equal to zero. In fact, every last one of them was equal to zero, just like we saw with the BIs. Right? They're all equal to zero. So since they're equal to zero, we have reached our goal. Because that's exactly what we wanted to show before. We wanted to show that every one of these scalars had to be equal to zero. And now we see that they are indeed equal to zero, which means that each one of these vectors is linearly independent from the rest of them. So we have indeed found n plus 1 linearly independent vectors in r over q, which means that the vector space r over q is, by virtue of our contradiction here, of infinite dimension.